Welcome to the AP Mondia African Symposium Special on People's Weather. It's a gathering of beekeepers from all over the continent. I'm your host, Chris Nicklin, chairperson of the Western Cape Bee Industry Association and a commercial beekeeper. Coming up. We discover what AP Mondia is all about. Honey is one of the world's favorite natural sweeteners. You're about to see which honey will be crowned the best in Africa. We'll also find out that not all honeys are equal. All of this and more in part one of the AP Mondia Symposium Special. I'm Araba Mukukwani from Lesotho, representing uh, the Bee Idea Company. Our products are mainly product of uh, medicinal vegetation in the high mountains, the high altitude of uh, Sub-Sahara in Africa. So we decided to attend the event to showcase our products, our capabilities, and what we can do as a country. This is the first full day of the AP Mondia Africa Congress in Durban, and with me is one of the organizers, Kai Hitchett, of the South African Bee Industry Organization. Kai, tell me how much work uh, went into pulling this together, because you've got people from all over Africa here. Morning, Chris. Yeah, it's been very interesting. Uh, we had, we've got quite a few people from right up, so even from Turkey, Germany coming in. Uh, we've got our VIPs coming in from South America. Professor Norberto Garcia, he's one of the leading people in Epimondi dealing with honey adulteration. We've got the Epimondi president, uh, Dr. Jeff Pettis, that is here as well. We've got Dr. Fanif from Greece as well. She's just done the first plenary now. We had a wonderful opening last night, and yes, it's been a huge amount of work for Tumi Mobo, my co-chair, and myself, and thank goodness we've had a very good local organizing committee that has been very supportive. Uh, mentioning some of those representatives or delegates from AP Mondia, it reads like a, a stellar cast of some of the big names in world beekeeping. It is, and it's actually amazing. And this is where Tumi Mobo and myself were in uh, Turkey representing South Africa at the International Open uh, Symposium, Istanbul, in August last year. And uh, we realized as South Africa, we really have to step up and move into the international beekeeping arena much more because there is so much and this is unbelievable how big that symposium actually is mm. and it is just a must for every beekeeper not just hobbyists but for every country to actually attend that symposium as well. Just to clarify things for the viewers uh, what is AP, AP Mondia and how does it straddle the world of beekeeping? AP Mondia is so we've got the different associations in South Africa we've got regional like you yourself chairman at uh, Western Cape Bee Association one of the largest in South Africa we also have the uh, regional beekeeping association, that's us, Sabio, South African Bee Industry Organization. So we deal with uh, very much, we can't control or we don't have any control over the associations, but we deal a lot with the government and the legislation. We're busy with, on our table. We've got uh, theft and vandalism, all that kind of stuff. And then in worldwide, we've got Epiomonde, which is the International Bee Association. So we part as Sabio, we're the only member of uh, Epiomonde in South Africa, and we're part of Epiomonde uh, as a member, and now we actually represent South Africa in the international marketplace. Mm. Would you describe AP Mondia as the, something akin to the world governing body of beekeeping? I wouldn't say it's governing because I don't think they have control. However, mm. they are the, the, the body that goes and they're busy now. I know for a fact that they are busy taking these guys and manufacturing what they call honey in the laboratories. They are taking them to court now sure. to actually to stop it because it is not actually honey, it's manufactured. Mm. Remember the definition of honey, it has to come from a bee and has to come from a nectar source. So it has to come from a floral source. Coming up, an interview with the MEC for Agriculture in Northwest Province. And I realize there's a lot of money in beekeeping and we've been killing money. And we go honey harvesting, hauling off nature's golden liquid from the hives. Various provincial agricultural departments in South Africa play a crucial role in the development and promotion of various agricultural enterprises, no less so than for beekeeping. And I'm really pleased to say that we're joined by Desbo Mohono. She's the MEC for Agriculture and Rural Development in Northwest Province. Welcome, Desbo. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, hello to your viewers. Jesper, how important is beekeeping in Northwest Province? Is it a long established industry or are you just getting into it? You know, we black people, 
uh, for a very long time, when we see a bee, we see an enemy and we kill it. <laughs> Until I was deployed to agriculture after the 2019 elections and I was briefed on beekeeping and I was like, what is this thing? And there was this uh, conference in Canada. I took some farmers there and I listened to the presentation that were made and I realized there's a lot of money in beekeeping and we've been killing money. And I said, when I go back home, I'm going to make sure that we support the, our beekeepers even though nationally has not as yet have a policy and a strategy on how we approach the beekeeping. Mm. And when we start, we had only five beekeepers who were struggling on their own. And we had an official in the department that was assisting those five uh, uh, beekeepers. But after attending this conference, I then realized the importance. Today, I can say to you, we have uh, 53 beekeepers in the province. We gave them training. We bought them the equipment like your smoker, like your extraction and uniform for beekeeping. And we continue to encourage them to get into the sector. So as a youth in, in, in beekeeping or apiculture, I, I was like literally recruited by my father. You know, and when I learned the dynamics of the business, it just took me by blessed. Hence my, 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 my persistence and my, my dedication towards uh, the business and seeing it grow. Yeah. And one thing that I have experienced in this sector is that Northwest is one of the provinces that is food insecure. And through beekeeping, we can assist the food security in our province. Mm -hmm. And also what I want us to do is to have an, an, a memorandum of understanding between our beekeepers and our crop farmers so that during pollination time, they agree, they pay a beekeeper for the bees to come to the farm and pollinate. Mm -hmm the crop that is there. I've seen this. We, we started a new program of potato as a province. We started with 10 young farmers. One of the farmers is a beekeeper and he used his bees to pollinate his potato. He surpassed the, 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 the terms that are expected from a newcomer in the potato mm. industry. So I was going to say, Desbo, you know, when you tell somebody you're a commercial beekeeper or a, yeah, a bee farmer, they automatically assume that it's just about honey, but pollination is actually the real value, the real value. that beekeeping provides to agriculture. One, one in every three mouthfuls of food mm. is actually pollinated by yeah. honey. And what other people don't know, during COVID, our beekeepers, they produce what is called propolis. Yeah. It was assisting with the chest to relieve mm. your chest. And a lot of people don't know about uh, it. Propolis is the bee glue in the sense. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a, a key liquid. antimicrobial yes, agent. Yes. So, so, so there's a lot, you know, our, our, one of our beekeepers that we have brought here, he has just shown me her spa in Zurast. Mm. He's, she's using the very same pro product mm. of bees to extract for the oil, for the massage. Mm and you can see their beautiful candles. There's a lot with, with the wax that you get from beekeeping. And, and if our people can understand that they, it's not only about honey, there's a lot involved in beekeeping. And as the government of the Northwest, we have taken a stance to say, we are going to massify this. As much as we have embraced cannabis and hemp, we are going to embrace beekeeping and allow our farmers to grow we give them exposure. In this uh, uh, summit, we've brought about 20 of our beekeepers from our four districts so that they get exposure. Mm. They see how other people are doing it. They see how other countries are doing it so that when they go back, they realize that I thought I was arriving, but there's a lot that I still to do. This is what I've copied when I was at the summit. Desmo, it's uh, terrific to hear that you're flying the flag for bees and beekeeping so high in Northwest Province on behalf of the rest of the country. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Coming up, honey competition judge Red shows us how to pick a champion honey. We tend to consume it so we get sugar high all day. <laughs> Honey judging is an intricate process, requiring much more than a sweet tooth. There are four honey judges, each with two stewards assisting them. Each judge is responsible for a category, 
and in the end the top selections will go through to the final judging to see which honey wins the title of Best Honey in Africa. Honey is judged on presentation, colour, density and taste. Let's see how they go about it. Warm welcome to you all. The honeys are going to be divided into the liquid honeys, um, light, dark and medium. But the medium is an enormous class. We've never had so many in one class. <laughs> so we're going to address that in a separate way so that the Kim will deal with the dark honeys and I'm going to deal with the light ones and then what we call select honeys and if you look around those things you will see that there are names on different sorts of honey from different sources like orange blossom and avocado and eucalyptus here um, and those we we judge in a class of its own so it's judged against itself. What we're going to do is just go through these um, and see what we can see here. Number seven here is overfilled. You can see that. The, the idea is this fill line indicates 500 grams of honey. So if it's under, then it's below weight. And if it's over, then you're being generous to your customers by giving honey away. Yeah, that's underfilled. You can see it's below the line there. This one is on the line and this one's over the line. So those three give you three different levels of filling. So this is a liquid honey class, and this honey is beginning to move towards crystallization, which is a perfectly natural process. <laughs> happens to all honey. It just happens fast in some and slow in others. Number 25 is beginning to granulate. You can see those, um, you can see the crystals through there, and there's a bit more at the bottom. Number 31 has crystallized, it's granulated quite a lot. And then 16 is spot on all the way through, and it's a lovely honey. It's nice and clear, and um, yeah, looking, that looks nice. 17, it's underfilled on the top there, it's underfilled consistently. You can see through the, you can, well, you can see through the top there, you can't see through those, so again, it's not filled consistently and these are looking lovely I can't see any dirt yet we will look at have a closer look later 21 lovely color beautifully clear yeah lovely sample it's about presentation it's about what you're looking for on a when it's up on the shop shelf does it look really good So these two sort of almost feel like they come out of the same hive. <laughs> <laughs> Very close. Those two are very close together. Taste almost identical. Right. This um, this item in the judging is measuring the density or the viscosity of the honey. So we want to see naturally how um, dense it is, or whether the beekeeper's made an error in how it is. Um, whether he's taken the honey off that's not ripe, it's not harvested properly. Um, basically, you're looking for beekeeper errors and the quality of honey being dense. So, we do a test like this. One, two, three. Okay, let's do that. One, two. See, it's a very liquid honey. Did you see that? Mm. You saw that as well. One, two. Yeah, it's, you can't even count. So, what you're supposed to do is correctly put your your fork on to measure how dense this honey is. One, two, three. It's, a, it's not a dense honey. So that honey cannot score high 
technically. You want the honey to be well-rounded, well-presented. Um, right, let's go for the next one. Let's find number 118 because he was a very nice, dense honey. No, one, which one was it? 83. So here we are. One, two, three, four, five, six. Do you see how nice and dense that honey is? So that is an example of a, a, a nicely put together dark honey. Okay, so he actually, one, two, um, one, two, three, four, five, six. He's almost the longest one we've had. So he's gonna score way up there, and then we'll come back and score them nicely. And if you want to contrast with this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You want the surface film to come up flat again. But this one's deceptive because it's beginning to granulate, so it does tend to thicken it. So, But the difficulty, if you have honey that is as runny as this, there's a very good chance it will ferment in the bottle because there are yeasts in honey in the hive. And so when you put it in there and it, the water level is, I'd be interested to, with his um, re refractometer to see what the level of water in this it would be. Uh, about 20. 20, that's a lot of water. Yeah. More than, more than the minimum, 18. Eight, 18 would be yeah, the minimum. Second. Then you can have a look in there. That's, that's running up at 20% um, percent water. That's, that's a lot of water. Yeah, about 19 to 20. Yeah. Just starting right. to 21. So, Ridge, let's talk about this competition that you adjudicated. Um, what sort of honeys were presented and were you overwhelmed? Were you surprised by the breadth of, of different profiles? I think, Chris, we, we were delighted to see such a generous amount of honey. We've been doing these honey shows with the Reconstituted Guild since 2018. Um, and each year the National has got bigger. And last year's National in November was the biggest we've had. And this is much bigger than the National. What have we left of these four? This is one, two, six. Beautifully presented. This is another one of those shiny ones, which strictly should have a reasonable density, which, it, oh, it does. Hey, look at that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Have density about seven. That's one of the best densities we've had. Mm. It's a gum. Mm. That's one of the best ones we've had. That line, and that is one, two, six. The difficulty with tasting honey is that you, you're swallowing honey all day. Whereas the guys, the guys who do um, wine tasting, they spit it out. We tend to consume it, so we get sugar high all day. <laughs> Is it a particularly tough journey or difficult journey to become an established honey judge? Do you need any particular skills, would you say? You've got to have, firstly, I think, a passion for honey and to want to see it as the best you can get. The second thing is you've got to have a reasonable sense of smell um, so that you can identify the different aromas in the honey and also a good tongue because honey starts its journey around the end of your tongue and gradually makes its way up until it gets to the final receptors at the back of your throat up into your, up into your nose and sometimes you get honeys that you taste all the way up and then suddenly there's, as somebody said yesterday, there's a U-turn and you get whoom, um, something catches you in the back of the throat. Probably euphorbia or something like that, which has got a bitter taste to it. Um, but it comes afterwards and you're left with that taste. So you get all sorts of different flavours. Increasingly, honey tastings, honey competitions are being compared to wine tastings, wine competitions. 
Is there any similarity? The similarity is you've got to use your nose and your tongue. I think the difference is that we tend to take the honey in to get our sugar high after a while. Um, whereas the, the guys can taste wine all day because they spit it out. <laughs> I think it, that would be the difference. Also, I don't think we're looking in quite as much detail in honey judging as wine tasters do. They want to find all sorts of different layers. I tend to be less specific in honey. Um, there is a, a whole world of honey tasting outside of honey judging, um, where they do work very similar to wine taste. So what do you look for in a honey like that, a, 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 an exceptional honey, if you like? Well, some of the select honeys come into that. We don't usually include a select honey in the champion bottle. Yeah, when you, you say select honey, what do you mean by that? Well, it could be the citrus class. I mean, that, may, that honey may have appeared again in the citrus class as a separate entry. Um, but whoever put it in, put it into the light class um, Which for the is liquid kind of honey. Open class. Open class for liquid honey. Um, so you're looking for something that is typically light, and, and citrus is often very light. And Feinbos can be very light, but I discovered in the Western Cape, Feinbos can go from very light to quite dark, and it all called Feinbos. So that's a new one for me. Um, things like macadamia have come into our competitions in the last three years. Four years ago, we wouldn't have met macadamia. Now we meet it in a medium class, and we meet it in a select class. So it's a evolving world honey and the different products or the different areas that honey is gathered from so so reg irrespective of the color of the honey what for you makes a standout honey a standout honey is one that has got an attractive aroma because when you open the bottle and you suck in through your nose that um, aroma that's sitting there between the top of the honey and the lid. And you only get one chance. So you, because when that's whiff. gone, well, it's a good hefty whiff, but the next okay. time you smell, it's gone. Because the volatile oils take time to release back into that gap. So you can open it later in the day and you will still get the same aroma, but not straight away. Then you want the taste of the honey to match the aroma. So if I'm looking for a classy honey, I'm looking for one that's got a fairly rich aroma. Could be a floral one, it could be like an orange blossom, it could be a lychee, it could be a gum honey. Things like sunflower don't have too much aroma. They're, they're farther flat. And even macadamia doesn't have something that really hits you. Um, but then you come to the taste, and very often the taste should match the aroma. And sometimes it's much richer than the aroma because you're rolling it around your tongue. But then you get all sorts of different textures. I mean, when we were judging the honey, there were some honeys that just run off your tongue and you just taste the sweetness. And the other. Others were sort of multi-layered. You can see that they came from different sources. They're not all from the same place. And some honey just sits on your tongue and then gradually dissolves. And then you, it releases different aromas as it dissolves and then as I say as it works its way around your tongue. You so when a beekeeper enters a particular honey into a competition they need to be as concerned about the consistency if you like as the taste and aroma. That's a very good question. Um, there's, there's what we call green honey. Green honey is honey that was taken off before it's fully capped. Now it might be a frame of honey that was completely uncapped. Before it's properly ripened. In other, exactly. It's not properly ripe. But it has an amazing aroma and amazing taste. But then when you come to the density, how dense is the honey, and you lift the surface film and you see how long it takes to return, you get some of these and they go one, and it's flat. And you think, yuck, this is liquid honey. Um, and then something like a, a good gum honey at the end of the season, citrus, um, will run up to even 10 or 11. I think the, the most dense ever found was a, a Feinbos honey that ran up to 12 seconds before it flattened. That is amazing density. That means that has been concentrated in the hive 
What is also catching us out this year is the amount of rain we've had. Because honey is hydroscopic, so it absorbs from the atmosphere. Um, and so honey that's already liquid, might get even more liquid. Then there's always the danger it's going to ferment. Um, because they're always it draws used... in a lot of... It's, honey is like a sponge, literally. It draws in a lot of... That's just right. Uh, yeah. ...moisture in the environment. It does. Which is interesting because it also absorbs smells in the environment. True. So if you want the other side of honey tasting, it's when you get foreign aromas in the honey and you say, well, if someone had their hive alongside, say, a farmyard and there's a slurry pit from the milking herd close to the hive, then while the honey is being made, they can absorb that into the honey and you get that sort of what we call foreign odor in the honey. Um, so honey is very susceptible. If just having the honey show here has raised people's interest level to say, it's another aspect of beekeeping. It takes time, but once you get into it, it's fascinating. Rig Morgan of the South African Honey Judges and Stewards Guild, thank you very much for the interview. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, number, number three is the, this is third place, and it's a macadamia, almost certainly a macadamia, where from it could be anywhere from the Western Cape, Eastern Cape, Natal to Mpumalanga, all the way down the coast. There are macadamia orchards now, a vast number, and this is one of them. This 183 is a classic Natal sugarcane with gum and a few other things, probably whatever's available, avocado, whatever's in season at the time, blackjack and a few other things. <laughs> Um, it has the most amazing aroma because it's got, and tastes, it's got multi layers of taste in it. Um, in contrast to the first, the champion bottle, which is a pure citrus that ha is a monoculture, and you've got one taste going through it, and it's the, what you would expect if you smell your orange trees in blossom. That's what you smell in here, and that's what you taste is that citrus flavor. So it doesn't taste like a lemon or an orange, or, but it tastes like the flowers. So you get those. And interestingly, um, the bees work these orchards best on misty days. Because by 10 o'clock on a hot day, the blossoms burnt off. So if you have, say, five days of misty weather, they pump this honey into the hives beautifully. But once the hot weather comes, by 10 o'clock, it's gone. So, and this one comes from Citrus Dahl. How's that? <laughs> I can even tell you where it comes from. Citrus from Citrus Dahl in the Western Cape. And this, I don't know, we'd have to look at who, who entered this one as to where it came from. But that one we know is Natal. And I can even, I would hazard a guess, I know exactly where it came from. But it's... Um, because I used to do a lot of judging in the town. <laughs> <laughs> You'll need to taste it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can that one's got it. full marks on everything. Yeah. Is it? 100%? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it 100%? Mm. Yes. Yo! Well, the presentation, I, I presume, it got oh, it is, 20. Yeah. 100%. Well done. 100%. 100%. Full mark on everything. This has got 100%. Coming up, some Piwe tells us all about bee farming in the Eastern Cape. And we just recently discovered a necessity for the traditional beekeepers in the, in the area. Sisi Piwo Dingan is a beekeeper from the Eastern Cape, and uh, we don't know an awful lot about beekeeping in the Eastern Cape and the extent to which it has developed, Sisi Piwo. So give me an idea where you guys are moving uh, in terms of commercial beekeeping, or in fact rolling out beekeeping activities in your province. So we are more 
subdivided into obviously commercial beekeepers and a lot of developmental beekeepers. And we just recently discovered a necessity for the traditional beekeepers in the in the area. Bees are regarded as ancestry or part of it. Yes, we can use the term customer relation. If you follow the history of the people in the Eastern Cape, it's mostly led by the Kosa people who have some tri sub-tribes from the Kosa and also other nations within the province. And um, it is believed that they are coming from the Ngoni descendants, which they used to use bees as to guide them for the better new sites for, for, for migration. So even today, uh, bees are taken as part of the human relations to interrelate with the environment and also to better manage the environment. So yes, what you relate into as a superstition, it's a custom belief that whenever there is a bee, it means there are many signs around custom into that. In fact, I have been into some houses in uh, the Transkei area where the bees living under the floorboards of the houses and the family living there reluctant to have them removed because they regard it as a kind of sacred relationship almost. And how viable do you think beekeeping as a career is in a place like the Eastern Cape? So it is viable, not viable, but obviously in general and average it is not so much viable. For an example, personally, I simultaneously uh, bought honey from Cola and rebranded and sell it and I realized that uh, selling honey is not a problem, it's in high demand, but producing it is a challenge. So I struggled to get um, good sufficient APR sites so that I could I could live on, on, on beekeeping up until um, I, I met uh, like-minded people because I dedicate myself into food security and I met uh, Professor Andy Koludidi who's a professor at uh, Plant Biotechnology Department at the University of the Western Cape, who really advised me that if I really want to do beekeeping very well in the Eastern Cape, I should focus on, participate on building the forage sites first, so that I can um, encourage more forage sites for the bees. And, and finally, CCP, well, what do you think you can benefit from attending uh, an event like AP Mondia Africa? What would you like to take away from here? To meet people, uh, like-minded people, and where I can assist them on their journey to develop the industry, especially for food security of all of us, conserving bees for keeping our good genical, bee genical traits. I fairly understand that we have African species that can tolerate most of the abiotic challenges that we face. So if that is the case, it means that we need to start conserving bees today. And for that to happen, we need, we need like-minded people that we can work together. We see a necessity into that. We might be the um, only hope throughout the whole world uh, that we continue having food on our table and we continue uh, keeping and taking care of our bees. CCP Wood in Ghana, thank you very much. For thank the you interview. so much. Coming up, Knowing the difference between real honey and so-called fake honey can be extremely tricky. We'll be taking a look at this after the break. In South Africa, we know that we're selling more honey than we're producing and importing together. So it begs the question of where's this extra volume coming from? An event like Api Mondia Africa is all about quality honey, the integrity of it, the taste of it, the purity. And uh, we've been hearing about the honey competition and generally the excellence of standards in the competition. And with me is Shannon Reaver. She's from a testing facility called FACTS, which stands for the Food and Allergies Consulting and Testing Services based in Stellenbosch in the Western Cape. Shannon, how big a problem uh, is fake honey, because we are becoming increasingly concerned about the extent to which South Africa is literally being uh, overrun yeah. 
yeah. with, with false honey, fake honey, adulterated honey. Yeah, it's a major problem. Um, worldwide, honey is one of the top three most adulterated products in the world behind milk and olive oil. Um, and in South Africa, we know that we're selling more honey than we're producing and importing together. So it begs the question of where's this extra volume coming from? So no, it's a massive problem. And I think the, we do have regulations in place to try and protect it, but no one's really checking as much as they should be. So no, there's definitely room for adulteration. It's an interesting point that you make that honey is uh, among the three top adulterated food stuff. Why is honey so susceptible to this? Well, food fraud in general, which is the term kind of used for adulterated products, it targets products that are easy to mimic. And honey being one of them, it is quite simple. I mean, if you get more technical kind of approaches, but in mixing in syrups and then adding bits of lemon juice to try and flavor it differently to disguise, you know, the sugary taste. It's a high demand product, so there's always someone who's going to want to buy it, and then it's easy to basically fake it. <laughs> How is it adulterated? So you get different types of honey fraud. Um, I always say it's quite difficult to actually draw the line of what is honey by definition. Um, if you have a real honey sample and you have heat treated it beyond measure that it actually is basically just a liquidy syrupy product, is that still honey? Um, but it, the, the accepted definition is anything that's been added to it to dilute it, it's considered honey fraud. How much honey is out and out fake or blended with things like corn syrups, yes. rice syrups. Yes, we don't really know. So in South Africa, they, you know, we don't have the kind of monitoring that we would like. Um, so it's difficult to give you a number, but I mean, I can tell you from what I've seen and what we've tested, there are definitely significant volumes of the fake stuff out there. But again, I said like, it's that fine line of when do you consider it fake? Is it just pure sugar or is it actually honey? It was once honey, but it's just been processed to such a point that it's kind of, it's no longer resembling the same flavors and health properties that you'd hope to. It, it depends on yeah, the consumer's perception of what they think honey is. But sure. yes, um, products that have been diluted in a way by having syrups added to it, we don't really know what's the extent. How can the ordinary member of the public pick up a fake yeah. product on the shelves? I mean, is it, is it easily discernible? People have this idea of um, honey being clear and liquid and runny and sweet. And so it's difficult for the average consumer to pick up those differences because that's what they expect honey to look like and taste like. If you're passionate about honey, I always say, if you're looking for a good product, try buy directly from a beekeeper as much as possible. You know, the further down the supply chain that you buy from, you've had more opportunity to introduce actual fraud along the way. So, you know, it's it becomes a bit sketchy. So the closer to the source you can buy, the more confident you can be that you're actually getting the real stuff. I know an old wives tale suggests that um, if you want to try to work out whether a honey on a shelf is uh, adulterated is to turn the jar upside down and see how quickly that bubble, yes. bubble rises to the top. Is that a test in any way? So there, there are lots of wives tales I've heard of burning the honey and you know seeing how long it stays alight, very interesting things. But of course you get so many different types of honey, so there's no real one trick that works for everything. Obviously it depends where did the honey come from, what's the floral origin of it, because as we know some are thicker, some are thinner, so it's not really a foolproof method, um, the only way you would really know is to actually test the product, So nothing really that the average consumer can no. do when faced with an array of honey jars on the shelf? Not really. And what makes it more difficult is there's so many different things you could add to the product. So one test might work for one type of adulterant, corn syrup, but then that same test might not work for rice syrup, for example. So it's important when you, even when we're testing the product in the lab, to try and make sure we test it using a variety of different tests to try and kind of capture all those potential adulterants. I always say it's like piecing together a puzzle. You're not 100% sure you've got all the pieces, but the more pieces you have, the better picture you get of the sample. Now, I understand that it's, it's 
all very well having these sophisticated tests to pick up fake honey, but that the honey fakers themselves are always getting increasingly cleverer and finding ways around these tests that, that you Of course. Out. So it's always, with us being the scientists, we have to try and stay one step ahead of the fraudsters um, and try and, you know, see what are they doing and are our tests detecting it. A good example is the corn syrup issue. So um, honey is typically, well, was typically back in the day, adulterated with a lot of corn syrup. And then everyone started looking at doing an isotope test where you look at the C3 sugars versus the C4 sugars, and you can see then if corn syrup's been added. But then rice syrup essentially is undetected in the test. So the fraudsters then just switched out corn syrup for rice syrup. So then you need to now say, okay, but what's specific to rice syrup that we can then look for that as an added parameter? So we're constantly looking, you know, what's happening in the market and how can we update our tests And what to, the fraudsters are up to. To do, yeah. <laughs> so Shannon, I have to ask as somebody who tests the veracity of honey, the purity of honey, are you a honey fan yourself? I love it. Yes, I'm very excited to be at this symposium. Um, I tried my first bit of mead today. I'd never had mead before. Um, but yes, I, as I've kind of gone down this rabbit hole into the honey world, beekeeping, yeah, you can, you slowly realize how the honey we buy on the supermarket shelves, <laughs> it's so far gone from that, you know, original extracted product that's so flavorful, beautiful array of colors. It's almost sad that, um, consumer perception is something that's kind of quite far removed from what we get directly from the hive. And as a honey lover and simultaneously a food scientist, how concerned are you about the inundation of fake honey in South Africa? Very concerned. Um, I think worldwide it's a problem, but locally, like I said, um, authorities, they do do a little bit of checking work, but not nearly enough. And so there's just basically been ample opportunity. There's high demand, low supply, and high opportunity because no one's gonna catch you out. So it's it's a real problem. And as a consumer, it goes against, you know, the Consumer Protection Act being whatever you pay for is what you should be getting. And you know, if you're gonna adulterate your honey or bulk it up with syrup, put it on the label. Say, you know, there are varieties out there that say honey and syrup. Just be honest with consumers. I feel like that's your human right. <laughs> Shannon Reva of the uh, Facts Food Testing Laboratory in Stellenbosch, Western Cape. Thank you very much. No, it was lovely to chat. <laughs> Coming up, we highlight what you can expect in part two of this Apimondia Symposium special. Mozambique Honey Company. Uh, we are from Mozambique. We are a small company that started in 2011. The, the convention is good now. We, are, we now find some two or three customers that maybe will make a business. And it's good now. The people are coming. One of the key sponsors of Epimondia Africa is the Ford Wildlife Foundation. And I have with me uh, Gabriel Satoni, who's brand ambassador with the foundation. What is the work of the, the foundation exactly, Gabriel? All right, so the work of the foundation is basically we support NGOs that are in conservation research, conservation education, and conservation generally in a bigger scheme of things in wildlife. We don't necessarily go out and do it ourselves, but we support the experts and actually uh, go and do the physical work that is on the ground as per project, as we call it, which is a period of about two years by loaning them a vehicle and enabling them to actually be able to do the work that we also appreciate just like today here. Yeah. Much needed support, I can imagine, because it's all very well having lofty conservation ideas, but we can't realize them without financial support that the Ford Foundation uh, among other similar bodies provides. No, absolutely. And I think it's, it's probably one of the things that you and I as a general public are not really aware of. We are aware of scientists that go out and do work, whether it's the coral reefs up in, in, in Sodwana, but we never really take time to think onto how do they actually get there? What challenge do they actually face? If somebody has got a, a small family car, surely being able to tow a boat is out of the question. And this is where Ford actually comes in and assist those that have pro projects that are almost in synergy with what we do as a foundation as well. How did you get into 
uh, the world of conservation. Um, because I, I understand your career trajectory has been largely through the media from behind the lens of a camera. Um, I love the way you respectfully put that. It's been more of watching a firefly um, at night. It's been literally all over the place. I'm a wildlife photographer, um, but I started off as just generally being a, a photographer. And I think being drawn to uh, the animals and, and, and learning about their behaviors, informally learning about their behaviors, that drew me to conservation. And I think it almost happens instantaneously. Those that do love creatures, that do love animals, the wave or the presence, the spirit of conservation immediately comes into it because that is your subject at the end of the day. So you go always and in any way possible to protect that animal as much as, as, as you can. And that's how I really got drawn in the, into it. Now with a couple of years down the line, I think with uh, Ford South Africa, with the Ford Motoring Company, realizing what I was doing, we sat down and they said, look, we would love for you to be able to represent our brand just from this segment as a Ford Wildlife Foundation brand ambassador. And that's what I am. And what I have to ask you is, how aware are you about the need to conserve are two indigenous honeybee subspecies in South Africa. They're not facing quite the predicament that honeybees elsewhere in the world are, but are suffering seriously as a consequence of forage loss and climate change and what have you, pesticides and what have you. Would beekeepers, beekeeper organizations be able to approach the Ford Wildlife Foundation for assistance in some of the conservation work that we need to do as a beekeeping fraternity? There are certain uh, um, checkpoints that we need to obviously go through, I think as a foundation as well. It is not merely a decision of two people. There's a whole committee that goes behind it as well and saying, if you have a project, for instance, that you would like to have a vehicle loan to, or in common words called sponsorship, does it take certain points that are actually absolutely important to us as a foundation? So in a nutshell, everybody is absolutely welcome to apply. Gabriel, thank you very much. That was Gabriel Satoni, brand ambassador for the Ford Wildlife Foundation. In part two, we learn about the likely devastating consequences of global warming on the world's honey industry. And do you know, there's a delicious honey wine called Mead. We meet the makers, judges, and enthusiasts of a drink that's surging in popularity.